So uh, if you have a financial offering this morning, there are two baskets in, in the back by the stairs going, you can drop some in there or you can give online. But it'd be better if you thought of this whole building as a basket and you are the offering. Um, and uh, this morning, let's pray that you would offer your heart, mind, soul, and strength. All right, let's pray. Lord God, we offer those things to you. Well, would you do that with your lips? Just, you, you don't have to, well, not out loud, but in your heart, Lord, just picture yourself handing him your mind. So as we preach, Lord, I pray that you'd help us to use our minds, offer our minds to you, our hearts to you, our feelings to you, our soul, our whole life, our self to you, our story from the beginning to the end, and uh, Lord, even our strength. We offer these things to you, Lord God, and we ask that you would help us together to preach. Amen. Uh, many years ago, I took my father and my friend Dave Jones to Tijuana, Mexico. Soon, my youth group at Bel Air Presbyterian Church would be traveling down to Tijuana to build houses for poor people that lived in the abandoned city dump where they would sort trash for a living. For a thousand bucks, we could build a home for a family of 12 who had previously lived like under cardboard, uh, thrown over maybe some old tires, for instance. I remember meeting a lady who had just given birth under a piece of carpet slung over a rope in the dump. I remember toddlers drinking from greasy pools of standing water in the midst of all that garbage as we looked across the border at San Diego. On our way back from the Tijuana dump, we drove by the Crystal Cathedral in Anaheim, California, and decided to take a tour. The tour guide showed us the organ. I can't remember the specs on the organ, uh, but it was something like the most expensive organ in the United States of America at that time. Absolutely extravagant. With the abject poverty of the Tijuana dump on my mind, and staring at the organ, this lady said, but of course, it's not our organ. It belongs to Jesus. And I grew indignant because I had done the math in my head. And so I just screamed at this lady, Jesus doesn't want a pipe organ. This organ could be sold and we could use the money to build a thousand homes for 12,000 destitute people just a hundred miles from this very spot. I didn't actually do that, but I thought that, and it's the thought that counts, right? That's what I've, I've heard. I thought it was just profoundly bad stewardship of the Lord's money. You know, when church folks talk stewardship, I've learned that we usually mean getting the most for what we give. We mean the safe and sensible utilization of resources. We mean utilitarianism. Utilitarianism is a product of the Enlightenment popularized by Jeremy Bentham at the end of the 18th century and then by John Stuart Mill at the end of the 19th century. In his book, uh, Utilitarianism, John Mill writes this, the creed which accepts as the foundation of morals, utility, or the greatest happiness principle holds that actions are right in proportion as they tend to promote happiness wrong as they tend to produce the reverse of happiness. By happiness is intended pleasure and the absence of pain. By unhappiness, pain and the privation of pleasure. Therefore, good giving is whatever I calculate to produce the greatest pleasure and the least pain with the limited resources from which I give. In the words of the Encyclopedia Britannica, utilitarians focus on the consequences of an act rather than on its intrinsic nature or the motives of the agent. It was in uh, my philosophy of ethics class at CU in 1981 that I read John Stuart Mill's Utilitarianism. Ethics is the study of the knowledge of good and evil, and I've concluded that 
most Christians, at least American Christians, are utilitarians. The good, then, is the action which you have judged to produce the most pleasure and least pain. In other words, you make a calculation in order to, uh, to, to, to give. You make a calculation and give in, in order to get. And it's as utilitarians that we read the Old Testament. And so the law makes some sense, right? Because if you murder and steal and lie, you produce a lot of pain. And you limit the amount of pleasure for all. As we've been studying before Father's Day in my little break when my father-in-law passed away, as we've been studying, God gave Moses the law, but then he had him put it in this freaky weird coffin, also called an ark, that was placed in the inner chamber of the tabernacle into which God would descend and then uh, rest or rule from the top of the ark. To approach the ark, which was the throne of God on earth between the cherubim upon the mercy seat, the people and the priests would go through these elaborate rituals involving sacrifice and producing atonement, which basically means how things wrong are made right. Being utilitarians, we naturally ask, how does the atonement work? And God being God doesn't exactly give us a definitive answer other than the life is in the blood and the life belongs to me. So he gives life and in sacrifice the Israelites would return life. Every time an Israelite would eat meat, the blood was to be returned to the tabernacle. And if the Israelite was outside of the camp hunting in the wilderness and killed an animal, the blood was to be poured out onto the ground. So utilitarians, utilitarians ask, well, why? Why is that necessary? And to answer the question, we come up with theories of the atonement. The predominant theory among American Christians is the penal substitution theory, which uh, suggests that God is love, but he's also this other thing that's kind of like the opposite of love called justice. And so in order to satisfy justice, there has to be a penalty like death to pay for sin in order that God might pay you or reward you with life. So sacrifice is the pain now that pays for the pleasure later. So Israel sacrifices now to be blessed with rain, crops, peace, produce, later. You see, the sacrifice accomplishes something, right? It's good for something. In the Old Covenant, God seems to be stringently utilitarian. I mean, he's incredibly uptight about the knowledge of good and evil. That is the law. And he seems incredibly uptight about how we approach him in the Holy of Holies where he peers upon the throne above the ark. So for instance, some Philistines steal the ark, mess with the ark, and God kills them. Some Israelites find the ark. After it comes back, they look inside. God kills them. Uzzah touches the ark, trying to save the ark as they bring it into Jerusalem. And you know what? God kills them. They would put bells on the robe of the high priest, tie a rope to his ankle, so that when he went into the Holy of Holies on the Day of Atonement, once once a year, if he died, they could hear him die. If he messed up and died, and then they could pull his body out with the rope, you know, in case God killed him. In places, God seems so very stringent, stingy, utilitarian, and terrifying. In other places, he seems so terrifying but not at all for the same reason. About 500 years after Moses encounters the God-man on the burning but not burnt thorn tree, like we talked about, and then receives the law, builds the ark, places it in the tabernacle, and watches the fire descend on top of the ark. About 500 years after Israel begins the journey uh, home to the Holy Land, Solomon, the son of David, builds the temple after the pattern of the tabernacle to house the ark as the throne of God on earth in the Holy Land. So in 1 Kings 8, 
And Second Chronicles 5 through 7, which pretty much reproduces 1 Kings 8 with some other stuff, we read about the day that the ark finishes its journey and takes its place on the holy mountain, the location of Eden, according to the Orthodox and the ancients, Ezekiel 28, Eden on the holy mountain. Then Solomon assembled the elders of Israel, 2 Chronicles 5.2, and all the heads of the tribes, uh, the leaders of the fathers' houses of the people of Israel, in Jerusalem to bring up the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord out of the city of David, which is, which is Zion. So they're building the temple just, I think, just to the north of the old city. And all the men of Israel assembled before the king at the feast, that is in the seventh month. Now that's the Feast of Tabernacles. And all the elders of Israel came and the Levites took up the ark and they brought up the ark, the tent of meeting and all the holy vessels that were in the tent. The Levitical priests brought them up and King Solomon and all the congregation of Israel who had assembled before him were before the ark sacrificing so many sheep and oxen that they could not be counted or numbered. And you see that's weird. Because utilitarians and Americans always count their sacrifices. I mean, whenever you buy a cheeseburger, you make a, a calculation and then sacrifice some money to enhance your pleasure and minimize your hunger pains. But you don't just keep handing the money to your waitress. So much and so fast that you can't even count the money. And so what's wrong with Solomon? Solomon. Offering so many sheep and so many oxen can't even, be, can't even be counted. It could be some sort of genetic an anomaly, abnormality inherited from his father David. Because you remember when David brought the ark into the city. Do you remember what happened with David? He started um, offering sacrifices. And keep in mind, this is after the ark has killed Uzzah. And David begins to trust God once again a bit later. But David starts making sacrifices and then strips down to this, this linen ephod thing that the priests would, bear, would wear, and then, and then he started dancing like Fred Astaire, or, or maybe Magic Mike, because the queen is scandalized at how David has exposed himself, his undignified behavior, and then he passes out gifts of bread, meat, and raisin cakes to all, to all the people. It's entirely non-utilitarian, totally undignified, uncontrolled. It's extravagant. Verse 7, then the priest brought the ark of the covenant of the Lord to its place in the inner sanctuary of the house in the most holy place underneath the wings of the cherubim, like the ones that guarded the way to the tree of, in, the, in the middle of the garden. The cherubim spread out their wings over the place of the ark so that the cherubim made a covering above the ark and its poles. And the poles were so long that the ends of the poles were seen from the holy place before the inner sanctuary, but they could not be seen from the outside and they're there to this day. There was nothing in the ark except the two tablets that Moses put there at Horeb, where the Lord made a covenant with the people of Israel when they came out of Egypt. And when the priests came out of the holy place, for all the priests who were present had consecrated themselves without regard to their divisions, and all the Levitical singers, Asaph, Heman, Judathan, their sons and kinsmen, arrayed in fine linen with cymbals, harps, and lyres, stood east of the altar with 120 priests who were trumpeters, and it was the duty of the trumpeters and singers uh, to make themselves heard in unison in praise and thanksgiving to the Lord. So they came out of the holy place, and when the song was raised with trumpets and cymbals and other musical instruments in praise to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. You know, that's the most repeated sentence in all of Scripture. And it's a little shocking because it seems like we threaten folks with the idea that his love might come to an end. Steadfast love endures forever. For he is good. For he is good. Isn't that the very thing that Adam did not know in the garden? And so he was tempted to take knowledge of good and evil. Growing on a tree in the middle of the garden on the holy mountain. Well, verse 13. When the song was raised with trumpeters and cymbals and other musical instruments in praise to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. The house, the house of the Lord was filled with a cloud so that the priest could not stand to minister because of the cloud for the glory of the Lord filled the house. At this point, Solomon calls out to all the people, reminding them of what God had promised 
and that a son of David would uh, one day build the Lord's house. Then standing before the altar in the courtyard in front of the temple, he delivers his famous prayer. And he asks that the temple would be a house of prayer for all the nations in order that, this is 2 Chronicles 6.33, all the peoples of the earth may know your name, Yahweh, and fear you as do your people Israel. 2 Chronicles 7.1. As soon as Solomon finished his prayer, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices, and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. And the priest could not enter the house of the Lord because the glory of the Lord filled the Lord's house. When all the people of Israel saw the fire come down and the glory of the Lord on the temple, they bowed down with their faces to the ground on the pavement and worshiped and gave thanks to the Lord, saying, for he is good for his steadfast love endures forever. So this is kind of wild, but you may remember that at the start of the journey, at the base of the holy mountain, they all begged God not to manifest his presence before them. Remember? It was dreadful fear. Now Israel praises God for his presence. It's holy fear. They know the good, and the good is steadfast love that endures forever. In the end, the perfect love will entirely fill the worshipers and cast out fear altogether. Perfect love casts out fear. But even then, and even there, 3,500 on Mount Zion, God has accepted their sacrifice. His presence fills the temple. The kingdom is secure, and the son of David sits on the throne. Do you understand what this means? Mission accomplished. The sacrifice has been made. Nothing more is required. There's nothing to get for which anyone needs to give. Next verse. Then the king and all the people offered sacrifice before the Lord. King Solomon offered as a sacrifice 22,000 oxen. You know, once a year on the Day of Atonement, they were commanded to offer one oxen, one male oxen, one bull. Solomon offered as a sacrifice 22,000 oxen and 120,000 sheep. So the king and all the people, and remember it was the people that had owned the oxen and the sheep, right? They dedicated the house of God. The priests stood at their posts, the Levites also, with the instruments for music to the Lord that King David had made for giving thanks to the Lord, for his steadfast love endures forever. Whenever David offered praises by their ministry opposite them, the priests sounded trumpets and all Israel stood. And Solomon consecrated the middle of the court that was before the house of the Lord, for there he offered the burnt offering and the fat of the peace offerings, because the bronze altar Solomon had made, which was humongous, bigger than that thing over there, well, it could not hold the burnt offering and the grain offering and the fat. At that time, Solomon held the feast for seven days, and all Israel with him, and a very great assembly from Lebohamah to the brook of Egypt. And on the eighth day, they held a solemn assembly at Soret. It should probably be translated festive holiday rather than solemn assembly. Uh, they held a festive holiday, for they had kept the dedication of the altar seven days and the feast seven days. On the 23rd day of the seventh month, he sent the people away to their homes, joyful and glad of heart for literally the good that the Lord had given, had granted to David and Solomon and to Israel, his people. Several years ago, I had uh, my assistant, my old assistant, Stephanie, call the Iowa beef processors. And together, we calculated that 22,000 oxen are 16.5 million pounds of steak, worth about 90 to 100 million dollars today. And I know that you utilitarians are thinking, that's a lot of bull, <laughs> right? That's way more than one pipe organ at the Crystal Cathedral, Peter. Yeah, it is. Not to mention 12 million pounds of mutton. And remember, a bull or an ox was not a hobby to these people. 
A bull or an ox was a livelihood, like a tractor to a, farm, a farmer. You know, it was quite literally their primary utility. This is what they used to, to live, as well as when the bull got old, meat for like an entire year. If we gave like that, we would show up at church with brand new top-of-the-line BMWs and just drive them off a cliff as we all laughed and danced with joy. And you might comment saying, well, what does this accomplish? What is this uh, good for? This is not sensible giving. This is, well, it's just a bit extravagant. The burnt offerings were entirely consumed on the altar. Nobody ate them. Nobody used them. The psalmist makes it clear that God isn't interested in eating any of them and doesn't need them. And yet scripture says that this is fragrant to him. It smells good to God, and it accomplishes or makes atonement. It makes a wrong right somehow. Perhaps sacrifice atones for sin, not because it pays for something, but because it is that something. See, that's the way it is with dad, with dads. The atonement for not mowing the lawn is mowing the lawn, right? That's what makes the wrong right. Perhaps not sacrificing is sin, and so, of course, sacrificing atones for sin, and the thing that is to be sacrificed is yourself. For the life that needs to be returned to the throne is what you previously had called your own. The peace, now the peace or the communion offering was sacrificed on the ashes of the burnt offering after atonement was made. It's never really said what it accomplished, what it was good for, except perhaps for that it fueled this like raging party, this immense barbecue. Unlike the burnt offering, the meat was to be eaten joyfully by the priests and the worshipers in the presence of the Lord. So it was a banquet of communion. Now, in case you think this is barbaric, the 16.5 million pounds of, of beef. Keep in mind that we Americans consume about 19 billion pounds of beef every year. And few of us even stop to return thanks for the life that's been given, let alone return the blood to the throne. I mean, maybe, maybe, maybe that's the thing that's truly barbaric. Well, 22,000 bulls and 122,000 sheep would require 20 sacrifices a minute for 10 hours a day for 12 days. No wonder Solomon consecrated the whole courtyard for offering in front of the temple. I mean, there would have been a literal river of blood mixed with fragrant oil and wine from the rituals associated with the offering and, and the grain offerings, a literal river of blood, wine, and fragrant oil that would have flowed from this communion banquet down the Kidron Valley through the Valley of Gehenna, or Valley of Hinnom, Gehenna, and then on to the Dead Sea, that is the abyss. The dedication of the temple appears to have lasted seven days, and it would have included the Day of Atonement, and it was immediately followed by the Feast of Tabernacles, which concluded with an eighth day that was pictured as a seventh day that is like, like the first day, so that the end is actually somehow the, the beginning. The translators call it a solemn assembly, but it means something like this. Everyone comes into the city from their own tabernacle. And in the tabernacle of God, they get down to the serious business of hardcore celebration. No work, all play. No practicing dance steps, only dancing. And what was the purpose of all this partying? What did it accomplish? What was it good for? Well, Scripture doesn't claim that it was good for anything. And yet it cost everything. And yet they seemed to think that there was no end to everything as if there was no such thing as limited resources in the Father's house. As he whispered into their souls, you are always with me and all that is mine is yours. The party was so extravagant, so uncalled for, 
and free. So generous that it's a bit terrifying. But not because God is stingy or utilitarian, but just the opposite. You see, it would be easy to think, gosh, I'm glad that the temple was destroyed. Because Jesus is so different, so sensible, so practical, a, a friend to the poor. And yet, you may remember that the week before he died, he, he went to a dinner in Bethany at the edge of Jerusalem where a woman anointed him with fragrant oil worth 300 denarii. That's an entire year's wage for, uh, for a workman or a laborer in that day. It was utterly extravagant. And Judas and the disciples, they grew indignant, and, and they say, this perfumed oil, this ridiculous pipe organ, it could have been sold and the money given to the poor, but dumping it on your head, Jesus, what's that good for? Jesus says, leave her alone. She has done the beautiful thing, literally the good thing. It's not good for something, it's just good. And then he says, she has anointed me for burial. Jesus is the Passover lamb. He is the anointed sacrifice. As Jesus hung upon the tree on the holy mountain, he would have most likely smelled that priceless fragrant oil in his hair, upon his head. So what's it good for? Maybe it's not good for anything. It's just good. And why did Jesus hang on that tree in the middle of the garden on the holy mountain? Why was that necessary? What did Je why did he have to die on a cross? What was that good for? It was rather extravagant. The blood flowed down, down the valley, through Gehenna onto the abyss, and right on into you this morning. For 2,000 years, Christians have been asking, why was it necessary for Jesus to suffer and die in the way that he did? Why was that necessary? Do you see that the question assumes that the death and resurrection of Jesus must be good for some other reason? We call our answer to this question theories of the atonement, but Scripture doesn't seem to give a clear answer to this question. So maybe the cross wasn't necessary for some other reason. So much as it is the reason that makes all things necessary. Like the word through which all things are created and sustained. Maybe God didn't have to do it. But he freely decided to do it. From before the foundation of the world and the beginning of time. Maybe he didn't have to do it. Maybe he wanted to do it. Jesus said, no one takes my life from me. But of my own accord, my own will, I lay it down. In other words, I want to. What if it was good for nothing? But instead, just good. Good for nothing, and yet the good in everything that's anything. Anything. What if Jesus is the fruit on the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? And what if Jesus is the fruit on the tree of life? If you take him and you utilize him to make things good, everything dies. But if he gives himself to you, he makes you good and he is the life. And if it happens all at once, your taking and his giving is the revelation of love. And in this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and gave his only begotten son as an atoning sacrifice for our sin. The cross is the revelation of love. And love is not good for some other reason. Love is the reason that anything is good. Life is a communion of unending, freely offered sacrifice, a sacrifice called love, and God is love for no other reason than himself. Three persons, one substance, love. 
when one person sacrifices in a world that does not sacrifice, it looks like and it feels like a man crucified on a cross. When two people sacrifice in a world that doesn't sacrifice, it looks like a marriage. And it feels like a honeymoon. When all persons sacrifice, it looks like the party in the Father's house, and it feels like one body dancing in joy, because it is. It's the body of Christ. Each member bleeds into the next member, and the moment of giving is the moment of receiving, which means the giving is getting. And the getting is the giving, and it's all good. It is finished, and everything is good. Second Chronicles 7.10 Solomon sent the people home with joyful and glad hearts for the good that God had granted, that he had given. So check this out. In the very place that humanity took knowledge of the good and everything died, God, who is the good, now grants Israel knowledge of himself. He knows them. And everything begins to live. So do you see how surprising this is? When you approach the Holy of Holies, which is the judgment of God, from the outside in, it looks like law, sacrifice, and death. But when the judgment of God, which is the Holy, approaches you from the inside out, it looks like grace, relentless love, and life. From the outside in, it's dance steps, pain, and sorrow. From the inside out is joy, pleasure, and endless dancing. It's eternal life. From the outside in, it's the law, self-righteousness, and bondage. From the inside out, it's like a fountain of living water that wells up from inside of the temple, the living temple. So when Solomon prayed, the Holy One filled the temple from inside out and spilled out of the temple and onto the people, and what happened? They gave extravagantly. When Jesus cried, Father, forgive, and delivered up his spirit, what happened? The veil in the temple ripped, and the holiness spilled out of that stone temple and into us as the son of David and the Spirit of God began to construct the living temple. On Pentecost, they freely sold all their possessions, shared all in common. No one lacked, and all worshiped with glad and generous hearts. It was like a fountain of living water flowing up, welling up from inside of them and beginning to fill all of creation with the glory of God. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul writes this. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, then at his coming, and he said from that time on, people would see him coming on the clouds of heaven. Then at his coming, those who belong to Christ then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and power, for he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. There were three commanded communal feasts in which all of Israel was to participate. The first was Passover, and it celebrated the first fruits of the of the barley harvest, when they first would harvest the barley. And we all know that Jesus is the Passover lamb. So Paul is saying that Jesus is like the first fruits of the new creation, firstborn from the dead. Pentecost is the second feast. It celebrates the wheat harvest. And it's a picture of us, the church, a kind of first fruits, according to Scripture. Christ's body filled with his spirit, even in this age, this in between age. The third feast is the Feast of Tabernacles, and it celebrates uh, the grape harvest, when the grapes are crushed and turned into wine. It celebrates the grape harvest, and it celebrates the end of all the harvest, the end of the journey, a new heaven and a new earth, entirely filled with love, including 22,000 oxen, if you're worried about the oxen, and the 122,000 sheep. So it turns out that the entire creation is God's temple, to be entirely filled with his glory such that every decision is nothing but love, which means everything that's anything is good for nothing, just good. In other words, the moment of giving is the very moment of receiving, the moment of getting, such that all pain then is contained in absolute 
pleasure. That is the moment you lose your life is the moment you find your life. Just as Amos prophesied in that day, the plowman will overtake the reaper. And the treader of grapes, him who sows the seed. You see, in that day, the giving will be getting and the getting will be giving. You see, I'm just trying to say that when Solomon dedicated the temple, I think the people of Israel experienced eternal life. Now. And I've wondered, what would that be like? And have I ever, ever experienced it? Have I ever given in such a way that the pain is actually pleasure? Have I ever done something good for nothing? Just good. Have I ever given such that the moment of giving is the moment of receiving? Have I ever given just for the sake of giving so that the giving is actually the getting? Has my giving ever been anything but sensible or utilitarian? Thinking about these things, I was thumbing through my old copy of Utilitarianism by John Stuart Mill from, from college. When I came across this page, just opposite the definition of utilitarianism on page 9, as if I just couldn't take any more calculation of the utilitarian ethics, on page 8, in all caps, I've written this. I love my girlfriend, Susan Coleman. Now I love my fiance, Susan Coleman. That's a Friday night. Tomorrow. You know, the ink could have been used to write checks to homeless shelters. But it wasn't. The following night, I gave Susan a ring that cost me all that I had. All that I had. Even though I knew, I knew she would say yes, regardless of the ring. A few weeks early, I'd driven my 67 Mustang downtown to Kenmark Jewelers on 16th Street, blasting REO Speedwagon out of my two coaxial power-boosted 220-amp speakers in the back deck of the Mustang. I was psyching myself up. Because my life was flashing before my eyes. At Kenmark Jewelers, Harry the jeweler, who's an old friend of Susan's grandpa, Harry started showing me the diamonds. I, I had no practical purpose for a diamond. And I can't tell a real diamond from a fake one, and neither could Susan. I tried to stay calm in order to drive a good bargain. Some stones, you know, I just couldn't afford. But others, were they were just too inexpensive. And this was a strange thing. When Harry would quote a price too low, I just wanted to grab him by the collar and say, Harry, you got to charge me more. Harry, I actually don't care about the diamond. I can't tell one diamond from another diamond. Anyway, I don't care about the diamond. I just want to give all that I've got. Harry, I got this girl. I already know she's going to say yes, but I want to say yes. I want to say yes as loud as I can. Harry, I want to pour myself out. Harry, I don't have to bleed for it. I don't have to bleed for it. I want to bleed for it. I, I, I want to sacrifice for her. I want to break my bank for her. Harry, it's extravagant. It's foolish. It makes no sense, but it's love. Is that wrong, Harry? And actually, it may have been wrong because I spent all my student loan money, which is pretty much your tax dollars. But I hope you get my point. I didn't give to get. And the giving was the getting. And even though it hurt, I mean, it really cost me, all the pain was pleasure. Is that what it's like for you when you give? at church. <laughs> but you know what? Forget about that. Is that what it's like when you give anywhere? Because you know, every good deed is to be a gift that you give. Not 10%, 100%. And everything you do is to be a gift given to God, a sacrifice of praise. For me, Honestly, I think preaching is about the hardest thing that I do. But I think it's the offering that I'm supposed to offer. But I usually don't feel like Solomon dedicating the temple. And I don't feel like I did that day when I bought Susan the ring at Kenmark Jewelers. Sometimes I'm asked, Peter, what's your favorite sermon? And actually, my favorite sermon is one that I've kept in my desk drawer for 32 years. 
One day when my daughter was a toddler, Elizabeth, she must have been around two or so, she saw me working really hard on a sermon. And I noticed her working really hard on, on something as well. And she walked up to me and she handed me this and she said, Daddy, I wrote you a sermon. I wrote a sermon for you. Then she turned around and walked away, happy. And now this is what has stuck with me all of these years. She didn't wait for my approval. She didn't wait for me to say, oh, honey, that's beautiful. Thank you. That's a wonderful sermon. She just gave it to me, and she did not expect anything from me. She didn't judge herself. She just expressed herself. And she was so happy. What I'm trying to say is that the giving was the getting. You know, sometimes I've given sermons and haven't gotten accolades. And things have not grown, they've shrunk. And I'm just miserable because I think I've given and haven't gotten. And sometimes I've given sermons and have gotten accolades and a nice paycheck and watched things grow dramatically, but I've still been miserable. <laughs> Maybe even more miserable for I think I have, I have to give in order to get, which means I never actually am giving and that means I'm never actually getting grace. And and then I'm constantly terrified that I just cannot give enough. But sometimes, sometimes when I preach, there are these moments when I forget about myself because I'm enamored of him. And in those moments, the giving is the getting, and I'm happy. And I think those moments are called worship. And I suspect those are my father's favorite sermons, even though they may look like scribbles on a page to me or to you or to anyone else. They are my father's favorite sermons until I begin asking him for val validation. As if I'm lacking justification. I take back my gift by trying to make it good for something rather than simply allowing it to, to be good. You know, if you're a parent, you know this. You can think back on your kids. But there was a time when whatever my children offered was good. But then each of them began to judge their offerings and compare their offerings one with the other, and then few of the offerings were good, and they were no longer happy. I think that's the story of all of us. You see, that's the story of Adam. Everything Adam did was good, but he didn't know it was good. And so he was tempted to take the fruit in order to judge the good, which made everything bad. It made everything bad until he came back to the tree and saw that what he had taken had always been given, and then he knew love is the good. Good for nothing, just good. Good for no reason. He is the reason. God is the reason. With each of my children, there were moments they took my life and I was able to give my life, to give and not get. And for that, I'm happy. I can't give in order to get, but when I've given and haven't gotten, they seem to give no matter what they get, and then everyone gives and the giving is the getting and we begin to know it for what it is. It's the extravagant party in the Father's house. So do you see what's happening in 1 Kings 8 and 2 Chronicles 5 through 7? When Solomon dedicates the temple on the, on the holy mountain, Adam, who is humanity, has left the garden and journeyed into the far country like the prodigal son. Even descended into the outer darkness like the prodigal older brother, but he is now returning to his father's house and the party that never ends because it is the end. Scripture claims that this will happen because it has already happened. I cannot make complete sense of the extravagant gift of God, but it's making sense of me and it begins to make sense to me when I picture God talking to Harriet Kenmark Jewelers. 
The Spirit says, Harry, I'm dedicating my temple and I, I want them to see. The Son says, Harry, I've got this girl and I'm just dying to show her my love. The Father says, Harry, I've got these kids and they don't even know who I am. And then they all say, Harry, we are love. A communion of sacrificial and endless delight. We are three persons and one substance. We're God. And we're making y'all, in our image, the image of love. And so God, in Christ Jesus, took the bread and broke it, saying, this is my body given to you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper and having given thanks, he took the cup and he said, this cup is the covenant in my blood, poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Drink of it, all of you, and do it in remembrance of me. Do not ask, what's it good for? How can I use this? This is good for nothing. At least in that sense, it's good for nothing. And, and yet, it's the good that turns nothing into something and makes all things good. This is the good from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. This is what we have done. Crucified the good. This is the Old Testament. And this is the good from the tree of life. This is what God has done. Offered the good. This is the New Testament. This is the revelation of love. And God is love. You don't use God. That's all I'm saying. You worship God. And he makes all your giving good. So if you spend a million dollars on a pipe organ, you know, to put in some giant glass building and it's worship, then it's good. If you make sandwiches to put in some poor people in the slums of Tijuana and it's worship, then it's also good. Don't be surprised to find it may be easier to worship God in the living temple of the poor than in the glass cathedral in An Anaheim. But, but either way, worship is a sacrifice of praise. It's giving without thought of getting. It's losing yourself and finding yourself happy, <laughs> like God. Thank you that you are, you are in us. So you're not only God with us, God, I think you're telling us that you are God in us. We are actually your temple. And we come here to be dedicated to you. So maybe you're afraid. You're like a kid standing in the darkness. And you're afraid because it seems like God, your Father, demands everything. And then maybe you're afraid because it seems like the more you get to know him, God, your Father, gives everything. But I think he has something to say to you. It's what he said last week. I think he says it from behind a curtain in the Holy of Holies in the depths of your temple. He whispers it into your soul. You are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. And I'm revealing that this, my child, is true. And when you believe, perfect love will cast out all that fear. Because you see, I am perfect love in you. Thank you, Father, that you are the good. <laughs> and now we know. In Jesus' name, amen. So, if you want to be good, 
It can't happen by making a calculation and then giving in order to get. It can only happen through worship. And then you don't make a calculation. And you don't give in order to get and you don't become good because you already are good. <laughs> so right now, may you believe the gospel and worship. Amen.